So now comes the Ellsberg paradox. We assume we have a non and K containing 100 balls, 50 are red, 50 are black, so it's known composition. We have another ambiguous or unknown urn denoted A. It also contains 100 balls, each ball is red or black, but we don't know the composition. We don't know how many balls are red. Maybe 70 are black, red and 30 are black, or maybe 95 are black and 5 are red. We just don't know. Unknown composition. Now, we're going to randomly draw a ball from both of these urns, and we're going to inspect the color, and then we're going to gamble on the color. Here's the notation of gambles. Here, what here I write, for instance, this is the known urn. The ball drawn from it has a color red. Then you get 20 euro, otherwise you get nothing. So here the price is 20 euro, and you're gambling on the color of the known urn being red. So that's how I, and otherwise you get nothing, of course. This is how I denote gambles. With that understood, question, so here is the gamble I already said. If the ball drawn from the known urn is red, you get 20 euro, otherwise you get nothing. Here is the gambling on the ambiguous urn. This says, if the ball drawn from the ambiguous urn gives color red, you get 20 euro, otherwise you get nothing. Which of these two gambles would you prefer if you had to choose? So you can pause the video and make up your mind and then come back. I assume you made up your mind. Well, most people have the preference as indicated here. Most people rather gamble on the known urn than the unknown urn. With the known urn, they have probability 0.5 of gaining the price. With the ambiguous urn, the composition is unknown. So, and in that sense, you don't know the probability of gaining the price. Well, then people rather have known probability than unknown probability, usually. So this is the prevailing empirical finding. We can do the same story with black. And of course, red or black is the same. So also with black, people rather gamble on the known urn than on the unknown urn. But now, these two very, well, Ellsberg, he didn't really do the experiment. He, he, it was a thought experiment. He said, that, of course, this will happen. And many experiments after have shown that, indeed, it does happen. Well, this is already enough to give a violation of subjective probability. In fact, any standard model based on subjective probabilities is violated here. And we have seen expected utility as a model with subjective probabilities. And we shortly mentioned others. But in fact, the only thing I'm going to use in my reasoning is that you use subjective probability and stochastic dominance. So almost every model you can think of, you will satisfy that. And therefore, because that will be violated, there cannot exist any model with probability in any sense to accommodate the finding. Now comes the reasoning. So assume for contradiction that your, the decision maker is using a model based on the probabilities, subjective probabilities. Then the first choice, just by stochastic dominance, is already enough to conclude that the probability of red from the known urn must be bigger than the probability of red from the ambiguous urn. Because of course you're going to take the biggest probability of getting the price. The colors black give a similar inequality, so we get that. And now we do, of course, we note that the two left probabilities are complementary probabilities, they add to one. Or two right probabilities also add to one. But then we have a contradiction, of course. This cannot be. It cannot be that two big numbers give the same sum as two small numbers. We have a contradiction. So we have here a violation of subjective probabilities. And this shows we need fundamentally new models. We can't just do business as usual, just subjective probabilities and instead of objective and then business as usual. No, we need fundamental new things. This, maybe you think this is a weird experiment in a, in a laboratory, nobody will ever do that. But many real world phenomena have this pattern, and many real world phenomena are based on this basic phenomenon. A friend's example quite like this is the home bias in finance. It's an important practical example. The home bias means you rather gamble on domestic stocks going up rather than foreign stocks going up, but also you rather gamble on domestic stocks going down rather than foreign stocks going down. But then you get this same kind of pattern with complementary probabilities that inequalities contradicting each other. So this is a very general phenomenon and something very fundamental is going on here. Anyway, so for ambiguity, we can't do business as usual. We need something very new that goes beyond probability. But that's really hard to invent because you know if you have events you don't even have probabilities how you how can you define a functional you can't even you don't even know how to define integral so it was really hard to invent and the decision theory justify any model of that kind 
It took a long time before anybody could do that. Only in the late 1980s came two clever persons, Gibor Schmeidler. They invented uh, some models for ambiguity. They opened up the field, so to say, for decision theory. Although the models in themselves had existed before in statistics, but they showed that this gave the preference foundation. They showed that in decision theory, it also makes sense. So then only the field of ambiguity could take off. But um, this uh, so this historical account, you know, late 1921, Keynes and Knight, 96 to 1, Ellsworth. So for a long time, economists knew we have to get this theory. They are very important, but nobody could invent them. Nobody knew how to do it. On the end of the 1980s, Came, uh, came people clever enough to invent it, then we have to catch up because ambiguity is very important to economics. It has always been uh, important, but now you, we understand why only in the late near 1980s the months took up. And then much we have to catch up with because almost every economic field ambiguity plays a role. And we should use such models. And this also explains why ambiguity is very popular today. It's getting applied in more and more fields and right so. And then I think uh, for young research, it's a good topic to take up and try to apply in all kinds of fields. It's a good thing to work on. And we are going to work on it and define models for it that will come in next recordings.